Nicholas, wake up! Wake up, Nicholas! What's the matter? Italy has just delivered an ultimatum. Oh, stop shouting. It's three in the morning. What did you say? The Italian government has just delivered an ultimatum to Greece. What for? Don't ask me. They gave us three hours to answer. Wait a minute. I'm coming right down. Bring your gun, Nicholas. Greece has already answered Italy. The answer is no. Listener, four years ago, war came to the people of Greece. This is how it came. You may believe me, for I know. My name is Katina Paxinou. To some of you, I'm known as an actress, but I speak to you now as a citizen of Greece. Listener, before that night of four years ago, you, if you had come to my house in Athens, I would have given you a cake of sesame and honey and fetch you a cup of wine. On my table, there would have been for you a dish of the sweet olives of Patras or the pointed olives of Kalamata. And perhaps outside, there would have been the cry of a boy selling jasmine, a cry I knew well and liked very well. This was before the war, and now it is all gone. In Patras now, the olive tree lies in the grove, splintered by the bomb. The boy selling jasmine is dead. Much that was, listener, is gone, and much that remains is starved and bitter and pale with hate. Now you shall hear a story, a story of one called Andreas. While I did not know him, doubtless he lived, for his story lives. And it is a story of Greece. The NBC University of the Air presents, through the courtesy of the Hollywood Victory Committee, Brian Donlevy, starring in the title role of The Story of Andreas, with Dana Andrews as Stamatis and Skippy Homeyer as Petros. This is Chapter 4 of the current historical series, We Came This Way, and is a special public service presentation of the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations cooperating with the Greek War Relief Association. We bring you now from Hollywood, the story of Andreas. My name is Andreas Dritzas. Before the war, I was a teacher. And then when the war came to us, I became a soldier. <laughs> it made people smile, for I was the kind of a man born to die from stepping on a rusty nail. I tell you this so that you will not expect me to be a hero. Over there, where the coast rises up in the broken hilltops and the mountains sit like a saddle between the plains is my village. I think it's the finest village in all of Greece. If you should look now, you will see a man lighting a wood fire or tethering his mule. His name is Stamatis. He is a very good fellow, always ready to share his loaf of bread with you and his cheese of goat's milk and to give you a drink of the sweet water that flows from his spring. Perhaps I am wrong for saying this because Tamatis is dead. And the water in his spring now tastes of metal. I shall begin with Tamatis. One day, he came to my schoolhouse and he brought with him a boy. Teacher, this is my boy Petros. I have brought him to the school for you to teach. Oh, hello, Petros. Answer the teacher, Petros. He is much skinnier than you said, Father. <laughs> I see you have taught him to speak, Stamatis. What else have you taught him? To read the sky for weather. Ah, good thing. To play a reed pipe, to tend the mountain sheep. Both good things, Stamatis. And to swear a little and to pray a little. Good things also. Uh, why have you brought him to me? I want him to have learning. What kind of learning, Stamatis? Lawyer learning? Teacher learning? Doctor learning? Too much, too much. Just a little. <laughs> well, how much is a little, Stamatis? Well, uh, I don't know. Well, shall I teach him history? Of course. 
Our history goes back 3,000 years. Oh, a boy must have a long memory for that. <laughs> Petros. Yes? Try to understand me, Petros. Everywhere you set down your foot in Greece, you stand in another man's footprints. Scratch away the cover of the earth, and you find some other man's bones, some other man's music, some other man's art. Those men, Petros, are your ancestors. It's proper that you should learn about them because they weren't ordinary men. Now, that's just what I wanted to say. <laughs> Do you want to learn about what I have told you, Petros? Oh, I've never been to a real school before. All right, Stamatis. He answers well, I'll take him. That is how Stamatis brought him, and how Petros and I became teacher and pupil reading in the ancients. Do you see anything wrong in that? And yet it was wrong... We were studying gentleness in the 20th century of the Christian era. We should have known better, shouldn't we? We looked into the Atika sky and saw it clear blue, and we did not look for bombers, and so we were fools. At Siva, we saw the almond trees and blossom, and we were fools again, for we did not dig a trench or measure the ground for landmines. Still, in the months that passed, Petros learned his lessons well. Medan again, Petros. Do you know what that means? Yes. It was inscribed on the Temple of Apollo at Delphi. It means nothing in excess. <laughs> Petros, what, according to Thales is the most difficult of all things. To know thyself. <laughs> and what is the easiest? To give advice. What is an orderly state, Petros? Give me Solon's answer, Petros. It is a well-constituted state when the people obey the rulers and the rulers obey the laws. stood before the dead heroes of Athens and said, and when the moment came, they were reminded to resist and suffer rather than to fly and save their lives. They ran away from the world of dishonor, but on the battlefield, their feet stood fast. Petros, never forget that. Yes, Petros learned his lessons well. In the days when the enemy was making plans to point his cannon and to let fall his bombs. But Petrus learned. And that was my happiness. And then one day, wet with rain and cold, Stamatis opened the radio. Since 5.30 this morning, fascist Italian military forces have been attacking our advance units on the Greco-Albanian frontier. Our forces are defending the national soil. Planes have bombed Patras. And the airdrome of Athens. Planes have also been reported over the bridge of the Corinth Canal. A general mobilization of all able bodied men has been ordered by the Greek general staff. The action of the fascist Italian government has come to a shock, as all who. I think there is nothing more to say. Yes. I think I will go upstairs and take down my. Stamatis, rifle. wait, wait. They are a nation of 45 million. And how many are we? Only seven million. Then to best them will be more credit to us, no? Come, Petro. I will show you how to clean a rifle. From this time, the boy Petros no longer spoke of Thalys and Solon. Instead, he learned to clean a rifle... It was a tragedy, a greater tragedy than you think. We wanted only to be left alone and to live peacefully in our own small corner of the world. And this they wouldn't let us do. And so we fought back. I think it is not wrong to say that we fought like men. 
defending our soil, our homes, our freedom. We fought like the Greeks of old at Thermopylae. First, we stopped the enemy, and then we threw him back, and then the enemy was pushed beyond our boundaries, and then it was we who attacked... What are you doing here, teacher? <laughs> I can also wear a uniform, Mr. Matis. <laughs> it's a bad fit. Perhaps if your shoulders weren't so narrow. <laughs> well, they're wide enough for the work I have to do, Mr. Matis. I'm in the medical corps. Watch out! Hold your head lower next time, teacher, or they'll have to bury the medical corps. <laughs> yes, thanks, Mr. Matis. Oh, Mr. Matis, I have news of Petros. Yes? He's in uniform. He told them he was 17. May he live. But it's a terrible lie. Oh, but you're really pleased, aren't you? Yes. I'd like to spank him, but I'm pleased. See that he stays out of trouble, teacher. He's still a little boy. Promise me. Yes. Thanks, teacher. <laughs> On the Epirus sector, bordering Albania, there are mountains. Mountains 6,000 feet in the sky. We fought there. Winter set in, but we fought there. The hail came stinging like shot in the sides of the mountain, which had been seamed and leathery like the face of an old man, were now icy and marked with death. And it was here, in this fantastic place, that our Greek soldiers, in their one thin blanket and their ragged shoes, sent the enemy whimpering to the plains. And then, when we were proudest and gloried most in our triumph, there was more news. What's up, Vasus? Is Agiro Castro taken? Yes, but that's not the news. Then it's Premiti. Premiti has fallen. Kuritsa also, but that's not the news. The Germans are moving into Bulgaria. The tourists have arrived. Tourists in field gray boots. Vassos, you're a liar. No, it's the truth. You're a filthy liar, Vassos. We've won our war. Not against the Germans, Stamatis. Not if they attack us. Father in heaven, we can't do it alone. We're tired, we're frostbitten, we're hungry. Someone must help us. Easy, Stamatis. The British are with us. Not many, but more will come, and some have already died. What's the use of it all? What is the good, Vassus? If the Germans are in Bulgaria, they soon will be in Greece. And what have we done to deserve it? That's our reward, Stamatis. We've beaten Italy. Seven million against 45 million. And because we've won, we lose. The order is to retreat, Stamatis. Retreat from the fascist Italians whom we have defeated. That was our humiliation. To triumph over an enemy and then to retreat before the vanquished. To retreat to meet new danger from the north. And I marched back with the soldiers of Greece. Soldiers frostbitten and swollen with cold and half naked and hungry. And I saw men weep with futility. And I heard men curse who had never cursed before. Then, for a while, we hoped. It was told us that the Germans were massing in Romania and in Bulgaria, but there was still time to hope, for the Germans had not marched, and the British lorries and the British gun carriers, covered with Greek flowers, were rolling up from the south. And then it fell. Germany must invade Greece in order to drive out the English. It was a monstrous lie, and we knew it. And someone had to answer the lie. On March 8, 1941, George Vlachos answered in a letter to Ed Adolf Hitler. Who made the British come to Greece, Your Excellency? It was not us. It was the Italian fascists. Now you wish us to say farewell to those whom the same Italians brought here? All right. Let us say it. But to whom? To the living. But how can we throw out the dead? Those who died on our mountains. 
who at a time when their own country was in flames came to Greece and fought there, died there, and found their graves there. Listen, Your Excellency. There are deeds which cannot be done in Greece, and that is one of them. We cannot throw out either the living or the dead. We will throw out no one, Your Excellency. We'll stand where we are, by their side. There is an infamy in that sound. It is not the bomb that falls which breeds the agony, but the bloody, naked fist which is powerless to answer. There is a degradation in empty hands, a degradation great enough to crush a soul. And our hands were so empty. Mark it down, then, the fatal month of April, 1941. The month of the beginning of our agony and our hate. Desperate fighting has begun in the Struma Valley. The frontier forts of Thrace are surrounded by German troops. No surrender. Fighting is still going on. German divisions have marched through the Vardar Valley to occupy Salonika. Greek troops in eastern Macedonia are cut off. The enemy has broken through the Monastir Gap. Greek and British Imperial troops are expected to make a stand at historic Thermopylae. The general staff announced today that further British reinforcements may not be expected because of the grave turn of events in Egypt. Citizens of Greece, Prime Minister Corisius has taken his own life. The king and the new Prime Minister, Tsudaros, have abandoned Athens for the island of Crete. We appeal to all Greek citizens to facilitate the withdrawal of the British and Imperial forces. The British had fought magnificently, and now we fought a rearguard action so that they could withdraw to fight again. Athens, which had greeted them with flowers, now said goodbye with flowers. And from the beaches of Rafina and Rafti, from the harbor of Naftlion, from Mechara and the Saronic Gulf, the troops of our allies left the soil of Greece, and Greece stood grim and pale and spent and turned slowly to see the Nazi come into Athens and hoist the swastika over the Acropolis. They're coming, Andreas. The Germans. No outcry, Stamatis. All right. Petrus, stay close to me. Yes, Father. I hate them, Andreas. I never thought I could hate. Like I hate them. Easy, Stamatis. They'll shoot you for less. Tell him what you told me, Petrus. The fascist Italians are to occupy Greece for them. They promise not to let the Italians in. The Germans promise. Softly, Stamatis, please, softly. There will be worse than promises broken. Tell him the rest, Petrus. The Bulgarians are to take Thrace and eastern Macedonia. Shh, they're coming. You there. You, boy. He means you, Petrus. Do you hear me, boy? Answer him, Petrus. Mm, are you his father? He's my teacher. So, you talk, eh? Can you shine shoes, boy? My shoes are dirty. Shine them for me. All the polish in Athens couldn't take the dirt from your shoes. So? I could have you whipped for that. But I forget I heard it. Now, shine my shoes. You're an Italian, aren't you? I don't like your tone. Oh, I meant no offense, but I suddenly remembered what an Italian named Cicero said to another Italian named Quintius. Well... I think the boy here knows it, too. He was once a good scholar for his age. Say, say it for him, Petros. Remember, Quintius, that it is the Greeks to whom you're giving orders. That's enough! He hasn't finished. Uh, just a moment. Go on, Petros. 
The Greeks have civilized all people by teaching them gentleness and humanity, and to whom Rome is indebted for those lights which he possesses. Now, uh, sir, if you will excuse us, we must go. Besides, Petros doesn't seem to own a shoe brush. <laughs> To an Italian, this could be said. For an Italian still remembers to be ashamed. But then, the Germans took over. Perhaps they wanted all the plunder for themselves, I cannot say. But the SS troops and the tank men with the insignia of skull and crossbones proclaiming their deliberate pride of horror, they came and settled like a plague of locusts and drove the Italians out. They ate our meager stores of grain, and we starved. We stood in hunger outside the restaurants of Athens, and we saw our enemy within, feasting on lamb and yaourt and halva. They sat and ate and joked as if they were men. And outside, famine stared in through the windows of the restaurant. Do you help an old man? I have nothing for myself. How can I help you? Only a bit of bread, please. The crumb of a crust. Old man, when I was a soldier, they paid me two drachma a day. Do you know how much a pound of bread is now? 800 drachma. Then give me an olive. I haven't any to give. Yeah, the stone of an olive, then. If I had it, I would give it. Yeah, I know. I only ask because I have nothing better to do. That's yeah, worse for you than for me. No. No, old man, it isn't. Yeah, believe me, I know. The old and the very young are weak. They die easily. We faint in the street, and where we faint, we die. Perhaps tomorrow the cart will pick me up. <laughs> no, it's worse for you than for me. But thank you for not scolding. Uh, please, sir, will you help an old man? <laughs> We took an oath to remember this. And even in our hunger, we began to make the Germans pay. They occupied the land, but we were undefeated. The workers came to the factories and folded their arms. The peasants refused to till their fields, and there was more. They walked in twos, and then in threes, and then in squads, for they no longer dared to go alone. And if we were in a prison... They were also in a prison, for a jailer must always watch and is not free to come and go. And then they lost their patience. These people have only one aim, to undermine the foundation of the new order in Greece. In the harbor of Piraeus, there is already a Swedish ship loaded with food and medicine from America. Under our very noses, they flaunt us at the aid received from these sentimental interfering fools. The question must now be raised. Is it worthwhile to go on being ceremonious with the Greek people. No. They decided it was no longer worthwhile. They decided also that while a man starves to death surely, he also starves slowly. And so they found quicker ways. In the Thrama Kavala district of Macedonia, the Bulgarians massacred the people of five towns and villages, every man, woman, and child. A man can comprehend one sick child dying of the croup, but who can comprehend many numbers? Perhaps this is what we became to you in the outer world, a gloomy statistic. I hope not. There is nothing more for me to say except this. My friend Stamatis was a good man and generous. It happened one day in the winter of starving that he came upon a woman named Elenie. I've stolen some milk for you, Elenie. Thank you, Stamatis. It's not altogether too late. What do you mean? Last week I had four children. All four need milk. But there was scarcely food for one. Yes, Elenie. I had to choose the mothers. They were three little girls and a boy. All right, Elenia, I know what you mean. Oh, I, I don't mind telling it. I don't mind anything anymore. I put the three little girls to bed. 
I covered them as best I could, and then I saw them die. They felt no pain, only weakness. You gave the boy the food, didn't you? Yes. Yes, I gave the boy the food. If he lives, Timatis, he will grow up to be a soldier. My friend Stamatis told this to me. There were no tears in his eyes, for there are times when there should be no tears, just as there are times when one must fight to die. Stamatis, who was a good man and my friend, went out of the city with a band of gorillas. Then one day, a railway bridge on the Athens-Thessalonica line was dynamited. And on another day, my friend Stamatis was shot by the Germans. They brought his body to us, and there was no weeping. And with his body, there was the body of Assos and others that I once knew. Then the boy, Petros, whom I had taught and loved like my own son, uncovered his little head, stood over them and spoke so simply. They determined that the hazard of their lives to be honorably avenged and to leave the rest. They resigned to hope their unknown chance of happiness. But in the face of death, they resolved to rely upon themselves alone. And when the moment came, they were reminded to resist and suffer rather than to fly and save their lives. They ran away from the world of dishonor. But on the battlefield, their feet stood fast. And in an instant... They passed away from the scene, not of their fear, but of their glory. You have just heard Brian Donlevy in the title role of the story of Andreas, with Dana Andrews as Stamatis and Skippy Homar as Petros. Madame Katina Paxenau was heard from New York in the story of Andreas on the NBC University of the Air historical series, We Came This Way. These stars were presented through the courtesy of the Hollywood Victory Committee. We return you to New York and to Katina Paxenau. Four years ago, we came, war came to the people of Greece. Now, at this later hour, Greece is almost free of Nazi. Athens is free. The Greek flag flies over the Acropolis once more. I speak to you now simply, humbly, prayfully. Let Greece's allies come not to an occupied land, but to a land whose people were the first in the world to show that steadfastness and courage could halt the aggressor. Let them not come as liberators, for Greece has liberated herself. The people of Greece ask for little. That little is yours to grant. They ask to be allowed to mold their own destiny without constraint or patronage. They ask for justice. In a time long ago, Greece taught all other nations how to live, and four years ago, Greece taught those nations how to die. And tonight, I repeat the words of President Roosevelt. It is more than fitting, it is inevitable that as hopeless darkness is engulfing the ideas of Nazi barbarism, the clear Greek air will once more be breathed by free men without fear of oppression, and that the Acropolis, for 25 centuries, a symbol of man's accomplishment in an environment of human liberty, will again be a beacon of faith for the future. And these words of President Roosevelt, translated for every freedom-loving person, mean, Yelas proristen azisi, get azisi. Greece is destined to live and will live. Tonight's program was presented by the NBC University of the Air in cooperation with the Greek War Relief Association, a member agency of the National War Fund, not only for the listeners in this country, but also for our servicemen and women overseas to be transmitted to them wherever they're stationed through the Armed Forces Radio Service. The story of Andreas was written by Morton Wishingrod. The music composed and directed by Thomas Peluso. Production was directed by Richard Tate and Ira Avery. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Thank mm-hmm. you.